Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by a radio legend, Jim DeRigatis. Jim, welcome to the show. <laughs> I don't know how legendary, Bart, but uh, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. So you are a music journalist, critic, and professor, but all of that fun stuff aside, we're here to talk about uh, something even more fun. Drums! Drums. <laughs> Drums. I know. I never get to talk about drums. I'm, I know. I'm this is thrilled. this is. You're in the right place. You're in a safe space here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I've been. A, I, I always say, you know, the oldest joke in the book and the hoariest. I am not a uh, musician. I'm just a drummer. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. I actually got that. We were once, once my radio partner and I, Greg Cott, were on the Conan O'Brien show. Wow. You know, and I actually you got to, you know, they, 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 all the pre-production, uh, you get interviewed two or three times, right? And all the producers say, you know, we hear you're a musician. And every time I say, I'm not a musician, I'm a drummer, right? And they <laughs> laugh hysterically. And then they say, don't, don't say that on the air, right? But like, oh, they asked God. me three times, I, I, I made the joke three times. And then I'm on the air with Conan. He says, I hear you're a musician, Jim. I said, no, I'm not a musician. I'm a drummer. And then they do this perfect spit take shift. To uh, uh, you know, what's his face, Springsteen's drummer? <laughs> oh yeah, Max. who's shooting daggers at me? <laughs> That's no. funny. That was his thing. Was the blank stare of Max? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think he was a little ticked though. And though I'm from <laughs> Jersey, I am not a Springsteen fan. But okay, good to know. Well, um, I should mention too that your your show that's been on for so long is Sound Opinions. Um, that that people are probably very very uh, aware of as listening to this, but um. So on that note, we are here talking about acrylic drums and the history of acrylic drums, which mm -hmm. uh, is super fascinating. I've had many, many people request this one over the last couple years, but uh, the the credit for this connection and our interview goes to Mr. Mark Fullerton, who who actually connected us, found your article, uh, I believe, from 2002 with Modern Drummer. Yeah, I'd written a, a piece yeah. for Modern Drummer, yeah, on the history of acrylic drums. And a resurgence at that point. It was only a year or two into the 2000s that uh, the manufacturers began making them again. Well, that's interesting. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll end up there in our conversation. But um, all right, Jim, so why don't we jump right in here and uh, you can tell us about how these um, very unique drums came to be. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating, uh, Bart. I was thinking about your podcast, which I'm a fan of. And, you know, when you think about it, really... Since the early 1900s, drums have not changed. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, wooden drums, metal hoops, uh, calfskin heads to 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 you know fiberglass uh, or plastic heads, uh, Remo. You know, um, and and uh, you know, but the basic drum set has never changed. There's been a million innovations on guitars and and keyboards, of course analog to digital and synthesizers, uh, but drums are drums. And, you know, yeah. as I look back at this article now, which is 20 years old, uh, really the, the biggest innovation, not only cosmetically, because acrylic drums look cool, uh, mm -hmm. but sonically, I think, uh, you know, has been the, the acrylic drum. So, you know, I, when I used to write for Modern Drummer just for fun. I mean, they paid so much less than all the other places I wrote. Uh, but as a drummer, I, it was fun to interview drummers and talk about, you know, chain driven or, or, uh, uh, spring, you know, what kind, what kind of, uh, uh, yeah. bass drum pedal and five, a nylon tip or hickory, right. You know, <laughs> uh, just geek out with other drummers. And so I, I probably did uh, a dozen interviews for this piece. Uh, and as I said, I wasn't getting paid that much. It was just a labor of love. I, I had bought, uh, a used uh, Vista Light amber set, the bottom mm. color, uh, yeah. and you know bottom looms so large over Vista Light and Ludwig. Uh, you know I didn't have those sizes, didn't have the twenty six inch bass drum. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Kept with my Marky Ramone, uh, Ringo uh, Star, uh, Charlie Watts sizes. You know, but yep. it was a thrill to have an amber Vista Light, and then mm. that got me uh, curious about the history of acrylic drums. You know, and acrylic, I mean, we could use the word plastic. You know, acrylic's yeah. a fancy word for plastic. Uh, plexiglass is a name brand. Uh, so is fiberglass. Uh, mm. But basically, we're talking about drums that uh, were made of giant sheets of plastic, heated, shaped to form, 
and fastened together with an industrial uh, adhesive. Um, and, uh, you know, that started with uh, Bill Zikos. You know, apparently 1959, uh, hmm. he had the idea to begin playing with making drums of something besides wood. And that's revolutionary because there have not been, you know, many, what else do you make drums out of? We'll talk about yeah. it. But Bill Zikos had this idea, but it took him a decade. You know, he wasn't selling his kits until the late 60s. Famously, Ron Bushy of Iron Butterfly, 1969, shows up with a Zikos uh, clear plastic acrylic set. Uh, you know, it took him a long time to perfect it. Uh, so we didn't start to see them until the 60s, and then they explode in the 70s. Yeah, well. Not literally. Uh no, I don't, I don't know no. of any exploding. I've had people, you know, people would complain <laughs> about vintage Vista lights uh, coming undone or yes. cracking. Being dropped or something. Being dropped. It was always in transit. You know, these yeah. drums take a pounding, a tremendous pounding. Um, you know, but but Ludwig uh, sold so many in the uh, early to mid 70s that there were bound to be a few lemons like the Ford Pinto. I, I made a joke in my uh, <laughs> in my article, you know, and there were some yeah. that were were bummers out of round or the bearing edges were not perfect, uh, which really ticked off uh, Zikos and the other big player Fibes because those were handcrafted and uh, essentially mom and pop companies uh, taking a tremendous amount of pride in those in their fiberglass acrylic drums in the late sixties, early seventies. So just to like. Like, get the timeline straight here. So, Bill Zikos in 59 can be credited with basically creating this uh, this type of drum. And I, I, I do always preface things with saying that maybe somewhere, literally even maybe in a different country, someone might have been experimenting it. I feel like there's always that caveat of, like, you got to be careful because... No, you got to be careful. And I'm not a... I, there are drum historians, as you well know, yeah. who have documented this stuff. There's an apocryphal, perhaps, tale. Might be true, might be false. That Ginger Baker decided to uh, home make a uh, kit of his own out of plexiglass or or perspex, uh, what mm -hmm. they would call it in the UK, plastic. And, and he heated it over the stove at home. You know, I had interviewed Ginger Baker, but it was years before, uh, you know, I did the acrylic drum piece. And, and you know, I, I, I was something I wished I'd asked him. When I was talking mm -hmm. to him, he was, he was on another planet and he was living in yeah. Greece on his olive farm. <laughs> <laughs> Great guy. Oh, but I man. could see him doing that, you know? Yeah, with a cig hanging out of his mouth with like a three inch ash. You know, yep. he's melting plastic. Yep. yep. He was a character. Mostly we, you know, talked about olives, you know, <laughs> mostly yeah. we talked about olives. So, That's so funny. Fibes, uh, I think Fibes got to the market quicker uh, mm -hmm. than, than Zikos. Um, you know, as I said, uh, Bill has this idea and he begins experimenting 59. By 69, we see Ron Bushy playing a Zikos uh, a plastic set with Iron Butterfly. Uh, you know, including that epic drum solo in Agata De Vita, right? Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really made people look because one of the beauties of uh, acrylic drums is the way they catch the light and reflect, especially with a group like Iron Butterfly, the psychedelic lighting, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're gorgeous to look at. And also, you know, drummers are not, in general, uh, very vain. We could come up with a fun show just listing <laughs> exceptions, right? Um, sure. But, you know, I mean, here's this instrument, you know, especially in, a, in, in metal bands or progressive rock bands that are obscuring 85% of the drummer, you know, and, and you could never see them. And now you can see a little more of the drummer through the see-through plastic. Stunning yeah. visually and stunning uh, in an audio way. So, you know, it was by the early 70s, 71, 72, Zikos is making a thousand plexiglass kits a year. But wow. uh, it was fives. There were, there were two guys in upstate New York, uh, Bob Grouso and uh, John Morena. Uh, you know, they formed this company, Fives, taking uh, a, a kind of a hybrid of vibes, good vibes, man, and fiberglass, right? Because they're going to make yep. acrylic drums. And, uh, you know, they start out and by 70, uh, Martin Guitars, which was a big company at that point, bought them out. 
And so it goes from, again, a mom and pop like Bill Zickos to a bigger company. And, uh, you know, they called theirs Crystal Light. And their drums start selling. Uh, Billy Cobham, you know, plays a double bass Crystal Light set with Mahavishnu Orchestra. Buddy Rich favors a Fibes snare, although he's mm-hmm. endorsing other drum companies, right? Slingerland, yeah. I believe, at Ludwig, uh, right? But he likes it. So why would Bill, you know, why would Buddy play a fiberglass snare? Because they're loud. They're louder. They're louder. And that made them yeah. not so desirable for a lot of jazz musicians. Zikos was, you know, was big in the jazz market. And jazz musicians find out that uh, playing acoustically, uh, these plexiglass, fiberglass, acrylic, plastic sets, uh, they're blowing people off the drum stand, right? But ah, nobody is going to be louder, uh, loud enough uh, drummer-wise uh, if you're an Iron Butterfly or, of course, Led Zeppelin. Yep. So, you know, yep. uh, Ludwig, uh, we love Ludwig. We all love Ludwig. But they are a big corporation, right? Mm-hmm. So they see Zikos and Fibes uh, making money. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want to be left out. And yeah. so... You have uh, the birth of the Ludwig Vistalite. Uh, you know, they didn't do them first. Many people say they didn't do them best, but they sold tons of them starting in 1972. Uh, they were clear. Uh, and then there were five colors, uh, blue, amber, uh, red, yellow, and green in that order yeah. of popularity. Uh, and you know, the drum manufacturers always keep wanting to sell drums. So over the first lifespan of Ludwig Vistalite, uh, they keep, uh, offering other, uh, innovations. 75, you get the rainbow Vistalites. You could choose, you could custer, custom order, uh, up to three colors alternating in one of six striped patterns. And wow. 78, they add uh, Christmas lights, Tivoli lights, <laughs> right? The Tivoli yep. set uh, came with a transformer, uh, built-in lights. Uh, I've, I've never found anyone who owned a set of those. I, I would now with LEDs, you know, you can get 150,000 hours of lifespan out of a tiny LED. Uh, yeah. but, but those Christmas lights, I mean, how many times, sometimes you take them out of the box and a day later they're burning out. I don't mm-hmm. know how reliable those Tivoli sets were. Uh, and then also in there, you know, Ludwig, uh, at some point dropped the green. So if you're a collector, uh, after the bottom set, uh, in Amber in his sizes, right? Anybody can have an Amber Vista light set. I did. But if you don't have the 14 by 26, the 10 by 14, the 16 by 16, the 16 by 18, uh, he, he usually played his, his metal snare. But if you don't have the bottom side, so the number one collectible from vintage uh, is the Ludwig Amber Vistalite in the bottom sizes. Uh, number two is a green Vistalite because they didn't mm. sell. Ludwig dropped them. Eventually, they added uh, white, black, and an opaque smoke. Kind of a combination of white and black, but uh, th- those were the Vistalites, and thousands of them sold. I think the 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 uh, the dark colored Vistalites. I guess it would be a black or the smoke Vistalite was always really interesting to me because mm-hmm. before I really got into this and really understood it as a kid, I would look at it and go, "But that's not a Vistalite. It's you can't see through it." Until I obviously, you know, I didn't realize when I was younger that like, yes, you can. It's just much darker, and it's the f- it is the acrylic, but. Yeah. I think they're really, really cool, but obviously it's sort of a different, uh, it's a little more subtle than a perfectly clear uh, drum that you can see through. So I always thought those are kind of interesting, the, the smoky ones, you know, it's it's different. Yeah, but I, I you know, if you're going to have plastic drums, why not make them see through? Yeah. I, I, I never had any interest in the black, you know, or the white, really, same thing. Yeah. You know, it was those colors that were so vibrant and and vital. And they showed off the Ludwig badge nicely, you know. It really yeah. popped that old blue badge on your Vistalite set, oh, and yeah. um, you know. But it it was ultimately Bart. It was the sound. I mean, I I did get to interview John Paul Jones a number of times. Never mm. got to talk to Bonham. I'm I'm not that old, okay. <laughs> uh, and and uh, Jones Jonesy told me uh, he fondly recalled the amber Vistalite set. It was just so cool to look at 
uh, Bonzo playing that. Uh, but I asked him about the sound of it, and he said it didn't matter. Bonham was loud no matter what he played. He remembered Bonham occasionally uh, backstage warming up on those old cardboard cases for the drums and mm. sounding like Bonham. He said he could sit there in the corner and play on his cases and you would have to stay, take a giant leap six or eight feet back because he was that loud. It's yeah. just whatever. But other drummers have said, you know, there are nice things acoustically because everything you think you know about acrylic drums is wrong. You think they would be harsh or ringy. They're not. There are far fewer overtones. And in fact, so when I first bought, uh, you know, that, that used uh, Ludwig Vistalite, I put on, uh, you know, Remo pinstripe and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to need a little dampening, you know, and they go, no, 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 no. What you want are the thinnest, uh, clear heads mm -hmm. possible because, um, you know, these are loud drums, but there are no annoying overtones and you can tune them really high up or you can tune them really loose. There's a consistency um, and I don't, you know, it's not just me imagining this. Many drummers talk about it. They record better. They mm. uh, mic up better live. Uh, they're louder. They cut through. Uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, they're not organic, right? It, it, no. it is the perfect drum for rock and roll because rock and roll is not organic, right? No, it's not. But let me ask you this. So, um, now, I've played, uh, I believe, some newer, like a DW acrylic kit, just, you know, at a drum shop. I've, I've tapped mm -hmm. on an old, like a Pink Fibes kit uh, that was here in Cincinnati at uh, Badge's drum shop. But so uh, let's say one set to another, Zikos to Fibes to Ludwig in that era, even to modern times. Is there that big of a sonic difference between these? You know what I mean? Because because it's plastic. Like, are you getting differences? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not in the way that uh, vintage drum collectors can talk about types of wood and three ply or five ply. I don't think so. I think an acrylic set is an acrylic set. And the differences were just, you know, Ludwig uh, could have, uh, they were mass producing them. So there were some, some quality issues. Uh, you know, whereas Fibes, when it came back on the market in the early 2000s, I mean, you know, Tommy Roberts uh, bought out the name. Uh, he owned a place uh, called Tommy's Drum Shop in Austin, Texas. And, you know, every band uh, above a certain size in the world makes it through Austin at some point, especially because of South by Southwest, uh, the mm -hmm. big annual music festival. So, you know, everybody would make the pilgrimage to Tommy's. And the Fibes kits he were building were beautiful. The the hardware, the rims, uh uh, the lugs, every, every, you know, uh, so I have now a green five set that I bought to celebrate, uh, doing this article. I probably made $150 for the article and spent three grand on my five set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a drummer, <laughs> but it was a business expense part. I'm a drummer. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I tell you, those are the best sounding drums, uh, I've ever had. And I have a, I have an old, uh, Slingerland set, uh, uh, late fifties, early sixties. My stepdad used to play in go-go bars. They're beautiful. You know, they're the three ply with the, the reinforcing. I mean, they're, they're really beautiful sounding drums. And for a while I owned a Yamaha, you know, uh, Rosewood, uh, recording custom, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first real drum set I bought new, you know, and, and I don't know, I'm not good enough drummer. I'm Charlie Watts or Marky Ramone. So I sold yeah. that to some guy who wanted to buy two of them to combine for a Dave Matthews set. And oh, I knew wow. it was the wrong drum set for me when he was interested. <laughs> you know, I'm like, ah, Dave Matthews, ah, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I never yeah. miss those. Uh, you know, and I, you know, every time I go to the drum shop like you, I'm banging on whatever's there. You know, we have mm -hmm. a, a great uh, uh, indie mom and pop drum store in Chicago, a Chicago Drum Exchange, right yeah. next door to Chicago Music Exchange, which is where you go if you want to buy a $15,000 semi-vintage Rickenbacker, right? You know, the <laughs> sure. drum the drum store has great, you know, old and new. And, um, you know, I, I've never heard anything better than the modern fives. Yeah, no, that's that's good to know. And 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 and, and Tommy was dedicated to, to following, you know, the methods that fives Mach 1 had used. So, yeah, I never played uh, 70s fives, but I can't imagine it sounded 
uh, any better than the 2000s vibes. Okay, so that leads me into my question now of of um, when they were first made. Obviously, it's it's the plastic, it's the acrylic that would be rolled and then and then connected with the seam. Which, as we know, the seam would oftentimes right. split or break, or that's where uh, that's where things get dropped. That's the problem area. But as time went on, they became more seamless. I don't want to jump ahead 30 years. Yeah, no, they absolutely did. That seam was harder to see, uh, was bonded better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're absolutely right. So technology advanced. And and I was thinking about this earlier. I I know that someone out there is thinking the same thing about the, uh, everyone out there who's seen, you know, the Bones Brigade stuff or the, or I should say the Dogtown um, and Z Boys kind of thing where they had the skateboard wheels that became the rubber as opposed to the hard uh plastic it it seems like it's this era of 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 plastics just getting better made a lot of things in the world easier and i loved in your article about how you, you had the quote from the graduate yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah plastics plastics yeah. is the future yes you know which he doesn't follow that advice but it was it was good advice i you know i mean a little ancillary uh note here that i didn't get into cuz the modern drummer only had so much space but uh, I was talking about how acrylic drumming, really, uh, drums, really were the, the biggest innovation we've seen in, this, you know, 120 years of drums, right? Um, I, I, there also was this brief period, late 60s, uh, mid-70s, where we had the North and staccato drums. Yep. Do you know those? Oh, yeah. I've had uh, Roger North on the show, and, and he referred to staccato as big underpants because they have the, like, they yeah, they were out. They were ugly. They looked like. Big pants drums, whereas North looked more like horns. And again, you have the big companies copying it, right? If you recall, I mean, because I used to treat uh, the Ludwig and Slingerland and Tama catalogs in the 70s and 80s when I was in high school as as like other kids uh, treasured their penthouse magazines, right? <laughs> I would spend hours looking at that. You know, so uh, Ludwig also, you know, not to be cut out, uh, made those for a while uh, acrylic plastic scoops that you could put at the bottom of a uh, single-headed tom, you know, and they had a brand name for it. I'm forgetting what it was. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, oh, sound projector. Ludwig put the you know, huh. sound projector, right? Because cool. not only do you have to carry your uh, uh, drums, now you got to carry these things, and they broke apparently pretty easily. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I've heard, uh, you know, I, I've recorded uh, a couple of albums uh, for my punk bands and uh, when I lived in Jersey for a, a sort of art rock band called Speed the Plow. And I've had recording engineers tell me, uh, how refreshing it is to to mic up a, uh, a fiberglass plastic set just because there's the, none of those weird ringing. I mean, no moon gel. You don't need it. And yet they're loud as hell, you know. Yeah. Uh, no overtones, no, no weird harmonics. They just are very easy to tune, and, uh, and then they're ferocious. Yeah, I have uh, the studio where I'm an engineer. We have a pearl uh, wood fiberglass kit that has been there forever. And I have recorded Mm. so many songs, little demos, whatever, just on that fiberglass kit. And it's just, uh, it's easy. You set it up. It sounds good all the time. Put new heads on it, tune it up. Yeah. And uh, it's got something special to it. They're pretty heavy. Those, the the pearl ones I'm referring to are, are heavy drums. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what was even heavier. Uh, you know, not to jump ahead to the sad end of the story of the first generation of uh, acrylic drums, but uh, in the mid seventies, right, we have the uh, uh, the war in the Middle East. Uh, what was it? There's been so many wars since then, uh, and it leads to the Arab oil embargo. Mm-hmm. And of course, a key ingredient of plastic is oil, right? Yep. And uh, suddenly, uh, the pricing of plastic drums shoot through the roof, and it really becomes impractical. Uh, Ludwig stops making Vistalite. Uh, you know, Zico uh, stops. Uh, Fibes stops, uh, now part of Martin, uh, you know, at that point. And the end, you know, the era of plastic drums is done basically by 81, 82. Uh, you know, whatever's left in stock sells uh, at bargain prices, right? If we could only take the Wayback Machine and go to when they're being uh, phased out and buy those kits 
new. Yeah. You know, you were you were telling me before we started the you know, the fabled idea of uh, somebody coming up with a stash of new vintage. You know, uh, <laughs> it, it, a store full of musical instruments from 1972. Yeah. I'd love it. Oh, that'd be nice. You know, the idea that there was still a niche uh, market for uh, drums that were not wood. Uh, prompted Ludwig to make a 100% stainless steel set. And it only lasted two or three years, and those were really super expensive. But uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, I scored one in, at the last oh, wow. half hour of the Illinois Vintage Drum Show. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, is, a, uh, that <laughs> is a fantastic sounding set, too. And I, I love my Fibes, you know, Crystallite, and I love the stainless steel Ludwig Vintage, and they both have a sound that, to me, is very different from wood drums. Sure, yeah. You know, and, and, and ideal for aggressive music, punk rock, or, or there's a lot of stoner rock bands. Uh, there were a fair number of prog players who played uh, acrylic in the day. Um, but but it, there is something, uh, when I said, uh, you know, the, the non-organic seems to fit rock and roll. I mean, let's face there's nothing sadder, right, than electric guitarist sitting there without his amp. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't become, <laughs> uh, you know, rock guitar until it's cranked through the Marshall. You know, mm-hmm. or if you're you know, a Fender Twin Reverb, if you're a little more persnickety and sensitive, right? But it's an electric music. It's a non-organic music. And and I think to get philosophical, this is the rock critic in me, brother. You know, yeah. it, it, you know, there's something about the uh, uh, acrylic drums that, that fit rock and roll. Absolutely. And you see a lot of people who mix and match and take an acrylic bass drum. And, and it even leads to um, like Orange County drums and percussion, OCDP, where, where like you'd see the jelly bean kits where they're multiple different colors. I mean, yeah. that was like the Blink-182, that kind of uh, no doubt look of for these drummers was to have the jelly bean kit with, uh, with the multiple colors. Yeah. It, it definitely fits. They have different generations and eras, which you've uh, definitely referred to. So... Um, yeah, and it's it's a way to stand out. It, yeah. You know, it's a way to stand out on stage. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, but also, you know, sonically and and visually. Yeah. Okay, so um it ended. Obviously there's the oil embargo, which I find fascinating. Obviously it's reminiscent to other times, World War II when there was the metal rationing, people couldn't use metal, boom, yeah. goes to wooden uh hardware. Um a little bit less serious than that, obviously, because it's, you know, acrylic. It's just a subcategory of drums. That's kind of the whole shebang with the, the wood stuff. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. I want to talk a little bit about the Dream Symbols recycling program. The recycling program is simple. Bring your broken or unwanted symbols, all brands accepted, into your local Dream Dealer, and you can earn $1 for every inch of symbol you bring in towards the purchase of a new Dream Symbol. For example, bring in two 20-inch symbols for recycling and receive $40 off the price of a new Dream Symbol. It's that easy. They, in turn, take the symbols recycled and use them to create new products like the ReFX Crop Circles and the Naughty Saucers. Check them out online at dreamsymbols.com and follow them on social media at Dream Symbols. When I think of the 80s, I don't particularly think of too many Vistalite. I think of the 70s. For sure, but what what was going on in the eighties yeah. with acrylics? You know, I think they disappeared. You know, I think the innovation in the eighties is that electronic sets are uh, are you know, or electronic elements, uh, their early syndromes and and uh, you know are coming into uh, vogue and the lindrums and and people are are looking to bring a different element to drumming through electronics, uh, and so I think that. Uh, that that uh, eclipses acrylics. You would think one of those manufacturers would have continued through the 80s, but but there really are no new plastic drums coming on the market, uh, you know, until people begin looking back. And, you know, I'm sure that, that old school kind of conservative drummers, um, you know, were laughing at the idea of acrylic drums in the 70s, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, they would have, have uh, you know, laughed even harder and people would have laughed at them uh, to think that by the late 90s, mid-90s, uh, you know, people were lusting after vintage 
acrylic. <laughs> you know, if they were considered fake drums to begin with, right? Now there is, you know, you know, there's for a generation the fabled Radio King, you know, or or snare or the the vintage Black Beauty, right? And now you have yeah. people lusting after the Amber Vista Light 1972 kit, you know. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, I love seeing them. I would love to get a set. I I feel like I see the. You said it was the most popular. I think under Vistalite, I see the blue Vistalites for sale the most. I'd say on on Craigslist and stuff yeah. like that. Th- those seem to be yeah. They were they were the biggest, most popular. And also, you know, uh, it wasn't just the hard hard rock drummers. Uh, uh, yes. Karen Carpenter played a blue Vistalite yeah. set. A good drummer, a really good drummer, and to sing as well as she sang while drumming, you know. But obviously, I, I, I obviously Richard being uh, her brother, Richard being the the sonic maestro there, they didn't go to Vistalite for the hard rock attack. I think they went to it for she was the front person of that band, and how yeah. are we going to see her better? What's going to be more eye catching? Uh, I think it was purely visual. There's nothing wrong with that. No, 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 no. You know, why Why would it be? You know, from the beginning, Louis Belson was a showman. Buddy Rich was a showman. You know, uh, drums were part of the show and and, and the yeah. biggest part. They took up a lot of real estate on stage. You know, you look at those, those turn of the century, early 1900s kits where they have, you know, cowbells and wacky gongs. And, you know, I mean, the drummer was always, uh, if you're going to take up that much real estate, give me something to look at. Yeah. So, um, and I know that there were some other players I know, and I, 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 I can probably quickly Google it, but I know Slingerland made an acrylic kit at some point, And I think it was very, um, rare. I can't remember the name. It's something uh, you can kind of yeah. guess what these names are. They have something to do with like, you know, being clear light. Uh, or they all have crystal light, Vista light. Yeah. 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 No. And Tama, Tama was making them, uh, at the same yeah. point. I wonder though. About, you know, Slingerland, Tama, the other companies, are they subcontracting like Zikos or Fives drums? They're not going to get Ludwig, um, you know, and putting their badge on it. You know, how sure. many people? And I've never, I, I, I didn't get to do any interviews with folks who were making the acrylic drums in the 70s, but I'm sure they would tell us. You know, because yeah. it took up it took up a lot of room in the factory too, because uh, you know Ginger Baker may or may not, depending on the legend, uh, have done it in the kitchen. But uh, you know, the the my understanding is that the drum, the serious drum manufacturers were retooling pizza ovens in order to heat up the sheets of plastic. Wow. Which is amazing, right? You know, because I mean, think about all the, you know, all the tooling and the dyes and everything that that are needed for the metal parts and the wood parts to begin with, and now you got to have pizza ovens on one end of the factory floor <laughs> for the fiberglass. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's unbelievable, and the thought of the tooling. I mean, the, the 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 companies who make their own drum shells obviously have to have a massive amount of infrastructure for wood. But then, like you're saying, is exactly right to get into mm-hmm. this world of like, and I'm sure you want these drums to be nice and clear. You don't want particles and little things getting in that hot plastic. So there's got to be all kinds of precautions. Yeah, vacuum pumps and 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 uh, and I don't know at what point the dyes were added to the plastic, uh, or were they getting it from plastic manufacturers already in those colors? Uh, but you know, you you mentioned uh, seeing a pink set, a pink five set at mm-hmm. one point. I mean, there are weirder colors out there that that m- some of them might have been one offs. Who knows? Uh, or somebody ordered it unique. But the fact that you could get your rainbow Vista lights uh, with three colors, any of the ones they used uh, in in six different patterns. I mean, that's that's really uh, a lot of variety. And, and yeah. you know some it, of the, the 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 other super collectible besides Bonham, uh, apparently reggae drummers really really loved having the colors of the African flag, all right. And uh, yep. b- bicentennial sets were huge, 1976, sure. right? Red, white, and yeah. blue. So yeah. those those were super popular as well. Man, I, I, what's crazy to me is, is, uh, and I'm, I'm loving learning is, is I didn't know. I always see them like on Reverb or on eBay, the different like stripe kits, and uh, I never knew that though those were custom yeah. ordered because I always see different ones. And I think to myself, like, 
okay, who's standardizing these? Well, Ludwig, Ludwig, no doubt, um, you know, made uh, a bunch of them uh, that weren't sure. custom ordered just to have one in every drum shop, right? Of which there used to be so yeah. many more. Um, so they were probably putting them out there. And who knows? I really wonder. You know how, how when, in theory, uh, when you buy a new car, you know, there's seven or eight colors and there's one you really love. And yet you go to visit three or four dealers. They never have that color. And they yes. say, we'll order it for you. And it takes nine months. You know, <laughs> I don't know. You got cash in pocket uh, for a drum set. I don't know if you're going to, like, like wait nine months for it. No. <laughs> or whatever. I, I doubt yeah. we could turn them around very quick. So I don't know no. how many people actually custom ordered. Who knows? You yeah. Know? And Ludwig is proprietary about a lot of that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. No, that's a good that's a good point where you might technically be able to, but but again, it takes too long. Yeah. It's just a nice idea that that in theory, <laughs> nice idea in theory that you could have done that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And not and I guess if you were custom ordering, you could have done like different trios and different stripes on every one of your drums. And boy, that would have been something. Yeah, they would have. I'm sure the guy who get, like reads the order would be like, "Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> seriously!" Right, yeah. right, right, right. All right. So, um, well, last question here. With while we're in the um, in this, you know, the the phase one. Uh, so, Fibes made Crystalite. So then, Vistalite is obviously just kind of a let's just call it a rip off on the Crystalite name, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I. I do love Ludwig, but but Ludwig was, uh, you know, they were they were uh, a big company, yeah. right? And big companies don't appreciate little companies innovating. They're going to put their mark on it. Yeah, Vista yeah. Light's a really cool name. Oh, you it's know, awesome, but, but yeah, it, it's kind of cooler than Crystalite. But <laughs> no, I <laughs> the I Fibes agree. folks got there first. Yeah, I agree. And, and another another note on Fibes too that's kind of cool. If everyone hasn't Googled it already, but Fibes has some like. Uh, like they're not perfectly clear. They have almost like the, like, uh, like, like showered, like window glass, like foggy glass. That's like kind of opaque. Um, that's not perfectly see-through, but it's got like a, uh, a frosted look to it is the word I'm looking for. Um, which those are super cool. They are super cool. They, they, you know, uh, it was always neat, you know, as a music critic, as a music journalist, I, I made 25 years in a row going down to Austin. South by Southwest. It's a real shame that Tommy was not able to sustain uh, the Fibes name because, you know, so 550 bands would come from around the world to play over five days of showcases at South by Southwest, six or eight bands a night, Bart. And, you know, you go into every club and, and you know, you got a back line when you got 35 minutes, right? So you'd go into every club uh, in Austin and they're they're literally worth thirty or forty, and see a different five set on every stage. It was wonderful, mm -hmm. you know. And the and the old uh, country roots rock, you know, would be those beautiful uh, sets that Fibes was making with the kind of, uh, you know, kind of kind of like rockabilly uh, vibe. And then the you know the alt rock or the stoner rock uh, club <laughs> would have the 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 crystallites. It, it was great. Yeah. That's awesome. And real it doesn't quality. get any better. I, I'm never. I, I keep. I keep my. I keep my crystal lights in the rehearsal space, so I don't yeah. have to play out with them ever because I don't want to carry them. Now stainless steel. I mean, I, yeah, those will. Those literally would. I, I could throw them at a car if I got mad at somebody <laughs> and they'd bounce back. A okay. Yeah, that's funny. You just have to clean the fingerprints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, you just Windex, right? Yeah, that, exactly. that's a really good point. I mean, learned. Learned the hard way, um, you know, the absolute best way to clean acrylic drums is if you go to the auto shop, there is a, a line of polishes and sprays called Novus, Novus 123. And um, you can get a gouge, a nasty gouge, you know, let's say the, the, the you know, the, the, I don't know, the basis is helping you load off and he gouges your, your, uh, plastic drum with the edge of the cymbal uh, uh, stand, right? You know, you can, uh, using the three polishes in order, the heaviest to the lightest, which is like a Windex spray, you, you take two or three passes at that gouge with your Novus polish, uh, a little bit of water, a nice, uh, like the fancy car rags when you're, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a 
custom car and you want to polish it. And, yeah. uh, and it just makes scratches in plastic disappear, disappear. Huh. It's wow. really, it's really handy. And even, you know, and even just having the, the, the lightest Novus, which is, I'm sure it's better than Windex. It's designed for all of the plastic and resin, uh, car companies and uh, you know, like vinyl tops and stuff like that. All of that. It, it's the right thing to clean with. Interesting. The That's stainless steel. Like I could probably hose them off in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the plastic well. drums I'm, I'm careful with. No, because uh, I've learned it on some symbol episodes as well, where you you think like, oh, let me just clean this off. But there's even with plastics and and wraps, there's still a thin layer of like a clear coat just kind of on top, or you don't want to rub that off. There's there's things that are designed right for that. Yeah, and the old jazz drummers used to say, "Let your symbols be filthy." Yeah. It adds to the character. Yeah, absolutely. So you're calling it phase one, kind of the the first you know iteration of of acrylic drums. When, in your opinion, did they start to come back? I think it's the, the early 2000s. You know, Modern Drummer thought it was enough of a trend in 2002. And I think, uh, you know, Ludwig had just started uh, with big fanfare, announced Vista Light would be coming back initially in one color, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, so I, I think it's it's a new millennial, <laughs> it, it, a new millennial phenomenon that, yeah. uh, you know, Fibes comes back in business, uh, Ludwig, and then everybody follows. Uh, you know, there are, there are very, I, I don't know, are there any manufacturers today that don't have some uh, uh, plastic? I, I don't know. I, and frankly, Bart, I don't want to look into it. I mean, I own four drum sets now, you know, and if I was <laughs> to do this article again now, I'd probably wind up buying another one. And nobody yeah. needs five drum sets, brother. I also did a phenomenal interview with... Uh, uh, there was a guy who, oh, I'm not remembering his name. There was an Italian drummer who was a collector of Ludwig and he had, uh, like 800 sets and I was on vacation in Italy. And so I got to write off the trip cause I went and did a story on him for modern drummer <laughs> kind of made up for losing $3,000 by buying a new fives. Uh, but he had them in these little sheds all in his, uh, village in Northern Italy. Uh, and he had, you know, he had like one of every Ludwig and he did a book on it. it you know, it was fascinating. So yeah, yeah, I guess there are people who don't believe you can have too many drum sets, but uh, <laughs> I, that's my wife speaking right now. I know. You, we needed you know, a you, new water heater. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real life things like that. Yeah, we had no hot water for a week, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Yeah, he was a great guy. Great guy. We had had lunch with him. We had, uh, and, I, and he showed me all the drum sets. So, wow, that's awesome. Now, maybe we, uh, we touch on some of those. So, so, my experience with one of the newer brands that I saw was Crush. I worked at a drum shop, and the guy um, who owned the shop was getting these. He was like, if you want an acrylic drum set, five piece, you know, standard sizes, 22 inch kick, I can get you one for $400 because he was getting them wholesale. They were coming in off of a, you mm. know, like a barge from, I guess, China. Somehow it never worked out. And I was, I was always bummed that it, it just like they were seven months behind or something. But you're absolutely right where I think now every single brand has one. Tama, Pearl. DW, which I've seen the DW ones and thought, hey, maybe that's an affordable way that I can get a DW kit, <laughs> even though it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. They're not right, cheap. But they're not cheap. Um, anyway, that sort of uh, leads me to a, a question slash statement about. So right now, I see the price of acrylic drums as being cheaper than their wood counterparts. Where I think you mentioned on the phone when we talked last week. Acrylic drums used to be more expensive, if not as expensive uh, as wooden drums. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, they they were not manufacturing to scale with wooden drums in the early seventies. Uh, so they were they were you know, and, and as Tommy uh, uh, of Fibes Mach Two said, they were actually more labor intensive to make than handcrafted wood drums because Fibes did both. Right. So they're more labor intensive and they're new. So they're not making as many. So initially, uh, uh, plastic drums were more expensive than the top of the line Ludwig, Slingerlands, Rogers, uh, uh, you know, kits in the early 70s. Then, so 1972, crude oil costs $3 a barrel. 
And then you have the Yom Kippur War. And by the end of 74, in, in the, so in the space of a year and a half, uh, $12 a barrel. Hmm. So now the main ingredient of plexiglass, fiberglass, it, 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 that's in 74. And I don't think the heyday really ends until, if we want to say, 79. I think the year that Martin uh, stops making fives crystallite is probably hmm. the death knell of the first round. Uh, Ludwig follows shortly thereafter, uh, within months, which tells you something. You know, they were trying to keep a leg up on fives the whole time. And they're Ludwig, so of course they had one. So it's done by 79, basically done by 79. And I think it just took a couple of years from 74 and that price increase. Uh, but they were more expensive than ever when they stopped manufacturing 79. And then they mm. were pretty expensive again when they come back. And I, I really credit Fibes with bringing them back uh, first because they precede Ludwig again. Uh, they were not cheap. I, yeah, you know, a a standard five piece set was going to cost you about three thousand dollars in in two thousand one, two thousand two. Yeah. But now I think that prices have come down again. Though I I don't want to. I I haven't gone shopping in a long time. <laughs> I don't want to be tempted. <laughs> no, what I've seen though is like I said, the DW kit or kits like that. I think when I saw it, it was around like a five piece kit was like, and it's very easy to Google, but I think it was around 1200 bucks um, yeah. for an acrylic kit, which, you know, I just think they're so cool. So um, it looks like I'm just Googling here, 1500, 1600 bucks, which again is not cheap. Oh, that's fair. But, yeah. um, you know, and I'm sure no, no. other other brands are a little bit cheaper than, um, um you know, DW and I do need to throw out there because I always talk in some form about the Japanese brands. I know in the 70s that there was some copy stencil Japanese drums that were acrylic. Well, I'd, I'd love to see one of those mm -hmm. Rob Cook books like he's done on Slingerland and Ludwig on acrylic yeah. drums. And they sure would be oh, pretty yeah. to look at, you know, but, uh, 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 you know, it, it, we've lived long enough where where they're now considered vintage and collectible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, You know, whereas before there was really a period I remember, you know, in like the indie rock 80s, 86, 87, 88, you know, your basic punk band, all they could afford was a beat up blue uh, Vista light set. And they, they looked like hell. They were scratched to hell. You know, yeah. there had been so many of them dumped on the market and then nobody wanted them, you know. Yeah. And now I think people have, you know, taken the Novus 123 polish and restored them, gotten the scratches out. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, one thing that we haven't, you know, it probably hasn't been long enough, but when you talk about Radio King, you know, snares or something uh, from the 20s, right? Or those three ply uh, maple reinforcement hoops, right? We know wood ages, wood is organic, right? Right. But I would bet you that a 1971 crystallite or uh, Vista light sounds exactly like a 2022 Vista light. <laughs> you know, acrylic don't age. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I do know that we talked about it before about how it, before it was rolled and kind of joined with a seam. Where I believe now what they're doing, and I don't know, yeah. you probably know better than me, but is it's it's a long tube of acrylic that's yeah. factory. You know, I guess there's just no seam, and then it's it's sliced. Um, you know, almost like a long, uh, God, what's one of those donut or those cakes where they just cut it yeah. down like a tube, like a roll. Or, or um, Italian pasta, like my grandmother would make. <laughs> yes. Ziti. Yes, yes. exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, like ziti, yeah, yeah, but Yeah, but I wonder about that. I mean, because they're, they're you know, with different sizes of drums, I, I bet there's some sort of heat polymer join now as opposed to, uh, I mean, at some point, you know, that there's got to be uh, a join right? The pl plastic isn't manufactured in a tube shape. Um, yeah, I know that the, on the old Amber Vista lights, which I stupidly sold at one point, and I got divorced, uh, you know, you could see the seams really, uh, you know, and, and Ludwig, you know, the badges were to the front and, and the hardware was to the back. And so they were pretty well obscured on the bass drum was on the bottom. But my fives, uh, unless you're right on top of them, you can't see where that seam is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, boy, they are collectible. So, I mean, uh, obviously, if people are out there looking, um, 
like Jim said, obviously Zikos, and I want to mention too that. So uh, for the the podcast, there's a Zikos episode that's going to be happening. That's very specific. Obviously, uh, Jim's done a great job of like talking about these these brands, but with anything, you can go way deeper. So I know I'm going to do one uh, specifically about Zikos and Fibes with um, Tommy um, that has been mentioned on this show um, mm-hmm. to get even more nitty gritty details about those specific brands. But um, wow. OK, so it sounds like we're as we're kind of close to the end here that that, you know, we're in uh, another generation of of uh, of acrylic drums because i see them all the time i mean i see them yeah. constantly you know old yeah. new people use them yeah yeah i and as i said i for certain genres uh i think that they're fantastic uh you know i don't know if you'd want to play old country you know on a on a, a, a acrylic drum set i i don't know if you'd want to play jazz on an acrylic drum set um but anything you know uh, where you're competing with the amplifiers. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Awesome. I mean, I, I, look, not for nothing, not for nothing do we think of Bonham always as synonymous. You know, it's, it's, uh, that was the sound and its song remains the same, the concert film. And it's, uh, you know, and, and, and like I said, John Paul Jones said he could play the trap cases and, and sound like Bonham. But, you know, something about the aggression and the boomingness of those drums, the volume and the power. You you do not have to, you know, uh, I've been in recording situations where I've had engineers tell me, you know, hit the drums harder. We're really trying to get, uh, and that's, that's when I used, I have a purple Ludwig wood set. <laughs> uh, that's using that nice. set. I've never had <laughs> anybody say that with the stainless steel or the, uh, uh, especially the, 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 the plastic i don't have yeah, to hit harder sure. and uh I- i'm plenty loud <laughs> it's what it's all about yeah exactly and and another thing that's there, there's the um uh not to keep talking about dw but there's the other uh we're talking about different uh techniques to make drums dw made that concrete snare which was interesting which i know i've, I've seen a few that I mean, the thing weighs a ton it seems to sound really good that i've what i've heard huh. on youtube i miss that one <laughs> yeah it's a concrete snare <laughs> wow that's kind of neat that's 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 a neat idea well why shouldn't yeah. you know i mean it's it's we're we're such luddites in some ways i mean really we are the the descendants of the first drummer was a you know a neanderthal banging on a hollowed out wooden log no doubt you know um but yeah. but it's it, it is really striking when you see the innovations in especially on the electronics ends of uh of keyboards and 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 guitars and basses, you know, uh, so much innovation. Uh, and yet drums, you know, two kinds still to this day, maybe three, if we count concrete, but how about a whole concrete set? Wow. Unless it's a permanent <laughs> backline at a club that, that would be fatal. Yeah. Yeah. You'd fall through the floor <laughs> and, and fellow, uh, fellow, uh, acrylic drummers, uh, do not skimp on the really quality carrying cases. Because that that is just what it, you know. It's not it's not dropping the drum even. Uh, it's 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 that thing where the bass player knocks over the cymbal stand, and the 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 lug nut you know scratches your drum. You know it can happen, but I've never had a problem with a bearing yeah. edge. That's interesting, um, man. Okay, Jim. Well, um, yeah, this has just been awesome, and it's so cool that uh, you've been able to uh, y- your article from two thousand two. That's what I love about all of this. And I think the podcast kind of falls in this category of uh, it doesn't like history doesn't change. Your article is still it's still very relevant. You know what I mean? The 1970s history isn't really changing that much. Um, So it's 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 all very true today. No, no. If anything, you know, we're just going to have the historian types uh, dig deeper you know, and have even more access than I had for one piece in modern drum, which is great. You know, when we saw that happen, nobody was interested in the history of drums at all until people like Rob Cook began, you know, forwarding that. And that's great. And now there's great scholarship out there. So, you know, eventually it'll be acrylics turn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Someday. And then they'll probably discover I got six things wrong in my modern (laughs) drummer article. But, uh, but it was, it was difficult at all to, to find anybody who knew anything in 2002 about acrylic drums. Sure. 
All right. Well, as we wrap up here, per usual, I want to say that um, Jim has been kind enough to hang out and is going to do a Patreon, uh, you know, 10, 15 minute bonus episode with me. And we're going to talk about uh, in his kind of extensive career here, we're going to talk about uh, some of the cool interviews he's had with some drummers and musicians and uh, some drum related stuff. Maybe hear more about that Ginger Baker experience where he's, um, you know, on his <laughs> talking olive. about olive farming. Yeah, <laughs> talking about olives. So. Um, and of course I want to give a shout out to Mr. Mark Fullerton, who has sent many emails that are great suggestions, um, and really appreciate him connecting me with Jim and finding that article. Um, so Jim, where can people find you? Where's a good, you know, uh, if they want to find your podcast slash radio show, tell us all about that. Yeah. You know, soundopinions.org. Uh, you can, you can, uh, podcast. We're on all the major platforms, uh, Apple and, and Spotify. Uh, but our website, you can, you can stream directly from there, join the mail list. Uh, we're going to be taping our 800th, uh, weekly episode soon. And we're on in most, wow. uh, public radio markets across the country. So. Jeez. That's Awesome. I'm a huge NPR. Yeah, no, I, I know. I know. Public radio is, uh, it never talks down to its listeners. You know, it is a smart and vital no. part of being, um, you know, plugged in. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've worked on, uh, I recorded, or I should say, I, I streamed from the studio a guest uh, on 1A, obviously, mm-hmm. which is a very popular NPR show twice. It was a guy who was uh, a, uh, proponent of teaching uh, teachers how to use guns in the classroom to protect oh, the God. teachers. So that was a that was a hot button topic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I just God. sat there and was like, yeah. I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> don't, it's, you know, face, don't betray any emotion right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So then Jim and I are going to hop over and do the bonus episode. So if you guys want to hear more from uh, Jim D. Regattas, then head to drumhistorypodcast.com and click the Patreon link and couple bucks a month you can get a uh, bonus episode every week and early episodes and all that stuff so um jim thanks so much for being on here and sharing your knowledge and uh your your love of acrylic drums oh it's my pleasure absolutely if you like this podcast find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time keep on learning